This is going to be a lesson about a certain aspect of the second coming that I've not heard taught on or preached on. A lot of people don't talk about the second coming to begin with, let alone the little details about it. And before we get into it, I want to say people want to make the events of Revelation only symbolical or say that they've already happened. They would say these events that you read about in the book of Revelation aren't really going to happen or that Jesus Christ isn't really going to come in the clouds. But in Acts chapter 1, it said he was going to come in like manner as they seen him go. In Acts 1, 9 through 11, it says when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So did he really go up and a cloud receive him out of their sight? That's literal, right? So why wouldn't it be literal that he's coming with the cloud? Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They said, so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back the same way that he went up, visibly involving a cloud. So the events of the second coming are literal. Watch out for people who say that they're not literal or that they've already happened. They say the events of second coming are, are not literal. Yet the events of the first coming are literal. And I want to talk to you about the white horses at the second coming. You're going to have people that's going to look at you like you're crazy when you say that Jesus Christ is coming with clouds on a white horse with millions of saints behind him on white horses. They're going to look at you like you're absolutely crazy because they think that's just a figurative thing for something. It just represents something. But you see, the Lord Jesus really rode in on a donkey at his first coming, right? Matthew 21, that prophecy about that, it literally came to pass. He literally rode on a donkey. So why wouldn't he literally ride in on a white horse at the second coming? Why wouldn't he literally come in the clouds? How else is he going to come down? You know, I mean, he's up in the third heaven, and that's how you would get down, coming through the clouds to get here. People just, they want to deny the supernatural. They don't believe in the supernatural. God is supernatural. The Bible's supernatural. Not everything is like it is right now. Right now, your life is just same old boring Dullsville every day. One day, it's not going to be that way. Just like in the Bible, you had supernatural things happening all the way through it the time you're living in right now is the oddball because right now you're walking by faith not by sight you don't see supernatural things happening like they did in the old testament you don't see a burning bush uh, you don't see a donkey speaking like balaam's ass you don't see somebody's shadow passing by somebody and it healing them. You don't see those type of things. You're walking by faith, not by sight. But one day, you're going to see it. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the, ev the evidence of things not seen. In the millennium, you're going to see Jesus Christ. There's not going to be any faith involved. You just, people's going to see him on a throne. They're going to see millions of people in glorified bodies like the Lord's, they're going to know God's real. There's not going to be any atheists. So, it's what's in Revelation literally is going to happen. 
And I also want to talk about this before we get into it. Are you a friend to the Bible? When you talk to a friend, do you say the things that they're saying, that the words that's coming out of their mouth, do you look at them and tell them, that's not true, that's not really going to happen. You're just, you're crazy. Do you look at them and, and tell them that? When they say something, do you say, that's not true, that's not really going to happen. That's what a lot of people do with the Bible that they claim to love. When you talk to people who claim to love the Bible, they approach the Bible really skeptically. When you're talking to a close, close friend, are you skeptical of everything that they say? If you're a friend to the Bible, you have some trust in your friend. At least some trust. You got people carrying a, uh, a Bible around they don't even believe it. They cast doubt on it. And everything that it says, they are skeptical of it. I don't approach my friends critically. When this guy pointed out a so-called error in the Bible, even if I don't know how to answer it right away, my mind doesn't just automatically go to, Wow, maybe my Bible really does have errors in it. That's not where my mind goes. Just like when someone gossips about my friend, I always think, well, he didn't really do that. There's a misunderstanding. Somebody's lying. I know my friend. He wouldn't do that. That's the way you got to be with the Bible. Somebody's pointing out a so-called error in the Bible. You... Approach the Bible like a friend. You give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. It's innocent until proven guilty. And it's never been proven guilty. And you say, my friend does not have a mistake. My friend doesn't have an error. Just, and the Bible shouldn't just be a regular friend. It's not a regular friend to you. It's called a holy Bible for a reason. If Jesus Christ is the living word and he's perfect then isn't the written word also perfect? How would it make sense to have a living word that's perfect, but he's got a written word that's not perfect? Can If Jesus Christ came into your living room right now where you're sitting or wherever you're sitting, are you going to look him up and down for flaws and errors and, and, and examine his life and point out and correct and reprove and rebuke and and all that. You're not going to do that. Just like when you got his written word in your lap, you shouldn't look at that and judgment and be critical and skeptical of the word that the living word has given you. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yet you got all these pastors and teachers who get up all the time and say, a better translation would be, a better rendering would be, this word should have really been this. Over here, that's an un unfortunate translation. It should have really been this. If you go to the Greek and it says, really says this, or, and they're just constantly approaching the Bible critically, everything that comes out of a Bible believer's mouth, they're skeptical of it. They don't believe the Bible. They read it and then they interpret it uh, based on what makes sense to them or how they whatever they want it to say i mean you just open the bible and read it you don't you don't have to make some big interpretation you just read it and say that's what it says and you just believe it just like i turned to revelation 19 and it says and i saw heaven opened and behold a white horse i don't have to interpret that i just believe it i don't have to come up with some big interpretation i just say okay there's going to be a day heaven opens and Behold a white horse. That's all you got to do. You don't have to be some big smart person. You don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. You just open the Bible, look at it, you read it, and you believe it, and you just go with it. <sighs> but with that out of the way, Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. 
Heaven opens two times in the book of Revelation. One time in chapter 4, you saw somebody go up. That was John, a picture of the church. And that was a picture of our rapture right there. The first time heaven opened. Now you got the second time heaven opens in Revelation 19. And you got people coming down with the Lord. And this is the second coming. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Notice Faithful and True are capitalized. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's about to start a righteous war. You see, he's not coming down and killing people unjustly. He's coming down and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Men who are so sinfully wicked and vile are going to be slaughtered. It's not like he's coming down and killing innocent people. He's coming down and killing wicked people. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Imagine that. Imagine being a lost person at the second coming and you're just eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, just living your life to the fullest, saying you only live once, uh, living for the moment. Then you look up and it, after all the events of the tribulation have went on and somehow they survived to that point and they still reject God, they're still blaspheming God, and they look up and behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and here comes a, is that a white horse? And is that somebody on it with eyes like a flame of fire, feet like undefined brass as if they burned in a furnace? And you're like, what have I done? Well, you've really done it. Jesus Christ is coming back with a vengeance and on his head are many crowns. He's got many crowns on his head most likely because the judgment seat of Christ has already happened and the crowns that the saints got, they threw at his feet and he put them on his head. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That white robe is going to have blood all over it. And his name is called the Word of God. And it's not going to be his blood this time. You see... When he came the first time, he, he was coming to show you his mercy and his grace and his love and his kindness and to sacrifice himself. And that's the, the coming that he wanted everyone to accept. Most people rejected it, so now you got the second coming. And he's not going to be a coming of giving the people on earth mercy and grace and showing them love and kindness. Now he's got to show them wrath for their rejection. You see, the you'll find that most people who don't take the Bible literally, they don't believe the Bible, they approach it skeptically, they got a completely different Jesus. They don't even believe what I'm telling you right now. But they only emphasize the love and the mercy and the grace of God. And, of course, God has all that. What they emphasize is one side of Jesus. When you only emphasize one side of him and completely leave out the rest, you've got a different Jesus. Paul talks about another Jesus. But this, the Lord, the Lord Jesus of the Bible, he is full of love and mercy. But he's also wrathful. And he's coming back in wrath. Clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. It's going to be the other people's blood being shed. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven. That's us. That's the saints. Jude talks about uh, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these also, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Ten thousands of his saints coming with him. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. So the Lord's on a white horse. We're on a white horse. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. And you got that same sharp sword. You got it in your hand. That King James Bible, Hebrews 4.12 
The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of mariners, and asunder of the thoughts and intents of the heart, that with it he should smite the nations. You see, this is the second coming. He's, he's not coming down to, to give anybody a pat on the back. He's coming to take over. He's coming to smite the nations. He's going to be king. He's going to set up his kingdom. And the nations are going to line up or they're going to lick the dust. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He treadeth the winepress. The blood's going to be up to the horse's bridles. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, so that's the second coming. And he's coming on a white horse. So let's talk about these white horses. I have not, I've not, I don't think I've heard a, a, a whole lesson on a white horses before. So let's examine these white horses and see what we can find out about them. The first thing about them is they have a counterfeit. The white horses have, have a counterfeit. So if you want to turn with me and look at this, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. Here is the counterfeit of the white horse. It says, John says in Revelation 6, 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. You see, everything that God has, the devil wants to counterfeit it. Look at this character here. This guy comes on a white horse. Like Revelation 19 we just read. The Lord comes on a white horse. What does white represent? Purity. So when the devil shows up, he pretends to be something pure. You know, you if you come up, if you show up dressed in like a gothic person or a emo person or like some death metal person, you might fool, you're going to fool some people, but you're not going to fool a lot of people. You come in white, pretending to be pure, you're going to fool some people. The white horse rider in Revelation 19, the white horse riders, they are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You see, and it says fine linen are the right, is the righteousness of saints. There's going to, right now, our clothes don't make us holy. But there's going to be a time when our clothes match our holiness that we've got. We're going to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we're, our, we're going to be clothed in fine linen, and our clothes is going to match our righteousness. White, pure, no spot. So this counterfeit white horse rider is going to be pretending to be pure and clean. He's a pretender. And the devil's a counterfeiter. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. It says, For such are false apostles. So you got real apostles in the Bible, that's good, but you also got false apostles. Deceitful workers. You got good workers, but you got deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So these false apostles, deceitful workers, are making themselves look like the apostles of Christ, just like that tra the Transformers movie. You see these Transformers movies where one minute somebody's driving a car, the next minute the car turns into this big robot out of nowhere. Or transforms into something else. A helicopter. Or a boat or something. But they were pretending to be one thing. But then turned into what they really were. These guys pretend to be something that they're not. It says, And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself is a transformer. 
Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. They counterfeit, they pretend, they imitate. False teachers can seem pure and holy. I mean, if a false teacher doesn't seem pure and holy, who's he going to trick? A few nuts out there will be tricked, but for the most part, he's not going to trick very many people. You can't, and you can't. I heard Danny Castle say this years ago. It always stuck with me is you can't always identify a false teacher by what he says, but you can identify him by what he won't say. They always have a positive message when the Bible is mostly a very negative message. When Satan showed up in Genesis 3 the first time, the first thing out of his mouth was, Yea, hath God said. It was a positive word, yea. He's a yes man. You see, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. He comes as if he's pure and holy. Just because something says Jesus on it doesn't mean it's of God either. You got all the contemporary Christian songs. It may say Jesus in it, but is it right? Is it pure and holy? Um, you got all these people that have another Jesus. Somebody that's... A, it, maybe this other Jesus, for the most part, it seems good and right, but is it missing a lot of things? If it's missing a lot of things, then it's not the same Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, 4, it says, For if he that cometh preacheth, an, preacheth another Jesus... Whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So the white horse rider in Revelation 6 is not the white horse rider of Revelation 19. The Revelation 19 white horse rider is Jesus Christ. The Revelation 6 white horse rider is another Jesus. He's a fake. He's in white. He's, he's trying to look pure, but it's not the real deal. You see, God has people, the devil has people. God has a Bible, the devil has a Bible. God has a bride, the devil has a bride. The Lord Jesus quotes the word, the devil quotes the word. Reve uh, in Revelation twenty two sixteen, it calls Jesus the morning star. In 2 Peter 1, 9, it calls him the day star. But what do the, many of the new versions do? They call the devil the morning star and the day star in Isaiah 14. You see, uh, it's a, he's a counterfeit. He wants to look like Jesus. He wants to be like Jesus, but he's a counterfeit. He's got a white horse, but it's not the real deal. So the white horse has a counterfeit. When, and that's the Antichrist in Revelation 6. That's not the Lord Jesus. That's the Antichrist. He's coming on a white horse. Look at Revelation 6 one more time. Revelation 6, 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. So he's got a white horse. The white horses look the same. But look at the rest. And he that sat on him had a bow. That's different. The Revelation 19 white horse rider has a sharp two-edged sword. And it says, And a crown was given unto him. That's different. This guy's got one crown. The Revelation 19 white horse rider has many crowns. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. But if you read Daniel 11, it says he comes in peaceably. He attains the kingdom by flatteries. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, he's not coming in peaceably. He's not obtaining the kingdom by flatteries. He's attaining the kingdom by violence and force and bloodshed. And he's going to be dipped in blood. So, two different white horse riders. The devil wants to appear righteous and good to deceive. So these white horses have a counterfeit. Now, the next thing about these white horse riders is they don't make the Lord's army any stronger. Um, all these white horses, yet the Lord's army is not any stronger with the horses than, the, as they, than they would be without the horses. 
Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in their horses, some trust in their chariots. Psalm 33, 16 and 17 says, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. An horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You see, the white horses at the second coming are nice to have. They look cool, but we don't need them. God doesn't even need us to help him at the second coming, but we're still coming back with him. Safety is of the Lord. So many times I put my trust in things down here for safety, for protection, for some cushion, putting money back, making sure I got a reliable car all the time, making sure I've got all this temporal stuff laid up. And that's not bad, but it should be God that I'm always looking to for safety and that I'm trusting in. Some trust in cars, some trust in s stuff, but you got to remember the name of the Lord your God. And even though these horses are going to be tens of thousands of in number, I mean, Jude one fourteen says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. If the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints, then there would be ten thousands of white horses. But once again, even though you got that many horses, there's going to be so many white horses in the sky coming down, stomping on the ground. Imagine the sounds of that many white horses coming at once. The safety is of the Lord. Deuteronomy 32, 30 says, How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? Leviticus 26, 8, And five of you shall chase an hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. You know, you think you have a large number on your side, and that puts the favor on your side because of the large number of people with you. But it's all about who's got the Lord. The Lord could win the battle of Armageddon coming out of the clouds by himself without us, without white horses, riding on Balaam's ass. If he came on Balaam's ass, he would still win. Without us, without the white horses, the white horses are incredible, they're supernatural, but they don't make the Lord's army any stronger. Okay, the next thing about the white horses is, when those white horses come back, you're going to hear the sound of bells ringing. In Zechariah 14, 20, it says, In that day, and any time you see that phrase, in that day or the day of the Lord, underline it, in the Old Testament, that's putting you, automatically puts you, Doctrinally speaking, prophetically speaking, in the context of the second coming and the millennium. And Zechariah 14, 20 says, In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. So they're gonna the white horses are gonna have bells on. And there's a common saying, maybe you've heard of it, that says, He came in with bells on. And that's the way it's going to be at the second coming. You see, at the first part of the second coming, the rapture of the church, where he takes the church out, it's going to be like in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. It's going to be more of an under wraps type of thing to where we're here one minute, gone the next. Second coming, it's different. It's going to be, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. We're coming in with the bells on. You see, that's where you get that common saying. The Lord is going to come to be noticed, and every eye shall see him. And see, these horses have two things that were like the high priest of the Old Testament. Uh, the high priest had on holiness to the Lord. And the Old Testament priest had a gold plate that said holiness to the Lord on there. And they had on bells. So the people could hear him doing the work of the priest in the temple. And 
what a lot of people say is that he had those bells on because if he just got struck dead in there from not being holy enough, he also had a rope tied to him. When they heard those bells stop, uh, make a noise, they would pull his dead body out by a rope that was tied to him. That's what they say. So this shows even the animals of the Lord are separated for the Lord's work, just like the high priest separated for the Lord's work. These horses are going to be separated for the Lord's work. The next thing, these white horses can breathe underwater. In Habakkuk 3, 8 and, and Habakkuk 3.15, it says, Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thy horses and thy chariots of salvation? Verse 15, Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, through the heap of great waters. And you see, when he leaves the third heaven, right under the third heaven is a body of water. A body of water that separates him from the sinful creation. You see, the creation has been tainted by sin, first from Lucifer, then from Adam. And there's a body of water separating him and the creation. When we leave heaven, leave the third heaven to come down, we go right through that heap of great waters. And you think that's crazy, but Psalm 148 and verse 4 says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Notice it said heavens, plural. So that's above the first heaven and the second heaven. The first heaven is our atmosphere where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the moon and the stars are. And then right above that, you got a body of water. And then above that, you got the third heaven. So we're going to be able to breathe underwater. We're going to go straight through that water. And then if we go through water on earth, we'll be able to breathe under that water. So they can breathe underwater. They can fly without wings. That's the next thing. Second Kings 2.11. And <coughs> I'm just uh, I'm just speculating here. But I speculate that these horses that came and got Elijah are the same type of horses that we're going to come back on. In 2 Kings 2.11... It says, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Most likely the horses of fire are the same kind of horses as the white horses at the second coming. And if not, they're probably similar. But the second coming is also connected with a whirlwind. That's another thing that makes me think that. So these white horses and horses are these horses of fire and chariots of fire. When they came down, it was connected with a whirlwind. Just like the second coming in the Bible is connected with a whirlwind. For example, Isaiah 66, 15 through 16. It says, for behold, the Lord will come down with fire. See that? And with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Imagine a modern day preacher getting up and teaching that. The slain of the Lord shall be many. No, that's not the Jesus they want to portray. They want to portray a Jesus that only is dishing out mercy and grace all the time. But you see that? That second coming connected with the whirlwind. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And them clouds is going to make a big whirlwind. Jeremiah 30, 23 and 24. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury. A continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it. And until he have performed the intents of his heart, in the latter days you shall consider it what's in his heart. The days of vengeance are in his heart. He's coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. 
And he's coming with a whirlwind with those chariots and those horses. And it's like when somebody goes back and forth to heaven, it's connected with clouds. And it's connected with this whirlwind. The next thing about these horses is they're not spooked. You know, regular horses, they get spooked. Not these horses. If if these were regular horses, they would be really afraid of what happens at the, at the second coming. You know, horses are would be afraid of fire all around them and smoke all around them. But look at the second coming in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, you got a great description of us coming back with the Lord in glorified bodies. Joel chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, A day of darkness and gloominess. Now, this is the prophet Joel. He's not a positive guy, much different than the Joel Osteen guy. Joel, the prophet, is very doom and gloom. A day, a day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds. Notice that. Clouds. Behold, he cometh with clouds. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning, when you see that morning, that could uh, a lot of times picture the second coming because Malachi 4.2, the son of righteousness, <coughs> S-U-N, but it's talking about the son, S-O-N, son of righteousness. Shall, the, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. So the morning, when you see that in the Bible, that's a picture of the second coming. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, showing you that this is not the locust army. This is a great people. It said a great people and a strong. There hath not ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them. If these were regular horses, they'd be afraid of that fire all around them. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. They can't get away. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots. On the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a p strong people in battle array. We're going to be a strong people in battle array. We'll have on the whole armor of God, and it won't be able to be to get off of us. Before the their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness like a nuclear blast going off in the people's face when we come down. Notice this. They shall run like mighty men. We're going to run like mighty men. Even your grandma that's in a wheelchair, if she's saved, she's going to run like a mighty man. They shall climb the wall like men of war, like Spider-Man. And they shall march everyone on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. No friendly fire. No accidentally stabbing your buddy's white horse or shooting your buddy's white horse on accident. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. It's not going to hurt you. Probably just bend, bend backwards like when somebody tries to stab Superman. You're going to be like Superman. Even greater, actually. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run up on the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. When Jesus comes, he comes like a thief in the night. The earth shall quake before them. Imagine a horse with the earth quaking before him. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. You see, it's a day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and a thick darkness, you see. This is a doom and gloom like type of thing here. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. Match in Matthew 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And, and then even here in Joel 2, and the stars shall withdraw their shining and the Lord <coughs> shall utter his voice before his army. 
for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Notice that. Day of the Lord. When you see that phrase, underline it. Because that's, that's important. That puts you in the context of the second coming in the millennium. And the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Nobody. You see, if the wild horses could get spooked, they'd be afraid of the smoke and the fire and the earth quaking and everything else. And they're not. These are supernatural white horses with supernatural riders. This is just like we will be in our glorified bodies. We're going to have these characteristics. And, and even now, you yourself, if you have full trust in the Lord, you wouldn't get spooked. You know, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. These horses are going to have full trust in the Lord. They're not going to be afraid of anything. And the last thing is, the, these horses, these white horses, are the Lord's threshing machines. These horses are going to stomp people like grapes. Exodus, or Isaiah 63 Two through four says, <clears throat> Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. He says, I'm going to tread the people in mine anger. Imagine the modern day pastor with his new version of the Bible, with his um, clothes on that look like a teenager's clothes when he's 60 years old or 50 years old, still trying to look cool to the people. Imagine him getting up and reading that the Lord said he's going to tread the people in anger, trample them in his fury, and have blood, their blood sprinkled on his garments and staining all his raiment with the people's blood. Them people would die if they heard him say that. He's, uh, the Lord says the day of vengeance is in my heart. It's in his heart. To kill some people. That's a completely different Jesus than they're preaching today. Just going around and preaching the love and mercy and kindness of Jesus. Those things are true about Jesus. But if that's all you're ever talking about, you've got the wrong, you've got another Jesus. You've got the wrong Jesus. You don't always identify a false teacher by what he says. You can identify him by what he won't say. And they leave out the second coming because it's so negative and because it's going to be a bloodbath and when you get up talking about Jesus killing a bunch of people I've heard this with my own ears face to face a guy I read this ver these verses to a guy I showed him these verses and he said do you really think that the Lord's going to do that I do believe that the Lord's going to do that because that's what the Bible says and if the Bible's wrong in Isaiah 63 then it's wrong. it could be wrong in John 3, 16. It can be wrong in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It can be wrong in all the other verses that he believes. If the Bible's right over here, then how is it not right back here in Isaiah 63? So, if you believe the Bible, you believe in the second coming. And these white horses are real white horses. If he literally rode in on a donkey <coughs> at a time in his first coming, he's going to literally ride in on a white horse at the second coming. Why is it that they believe all the prophecies about the first coming were fulfilled literally, but all the prophecies of the second coming are just a spiritual thing? That's not being honest when you study the Bible at all. If you are going to make the second coming symbolic, and you're making the first coming all literal. These, these white horses, 
It's the Lord's threshing machine. They're going to be stomping the people like a bunch of grapes. Revelation 14, 19 through 20 says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and the blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles. By the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs, it's going to be a bloodbath. The blood's going to stain his raiment. It's going to... The, the white horses is going to have blood all over them. And he's <clears throat> doing this to set up his kingdom. He's got to get rid of all the God-haters. He's got to get rid of those that that are on the devil's side. And he's going to set up his kingdom. And he's going to reign on a throne in Jerusalem. You're going to come and worship him. Or you're not going to even get any rain for your crops. He's going to be the ultimate dictator. He's the only dictator that could be good because he's sinless so when he sets up his kingdom say goodbye to crime say goodbye to drug trafficking sex trafficking say goodbye to all this corruption that you got going on in the governments of the world he's going to rule in righteousness nothing's going to be able to get by him and he's going to have millions of People and born-again believers and glorified bodies spread out everywhere. You're not going to be able to get anything by anybody. It's going to be a time of perfect peace. The devil's going to be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He's going to cause the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Nobody's going to be prophesying, so there's not going to be no false. There's going to be no false prophets. The Lord's going to be teaching us. And you're not going to go and uh, it's not going to be like every man his neighbor going to his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for all shall know him from the least to the greatest. They're going to be able to see him reigning in Jerusalem. Everybody's going to know about him. There's not going to be an atheist. You're going to visibly see him. You know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not going to take faith. To know he's there. You're going to know he's there. You see, you're going to see him with your own two eyes. You're going to be. You're not going to be walking by faith. You're going to be walking by sight. But with that being said. Always take the Bible. Literally. These are the white horses. At the second coming. 